The most interesting thing about the piece of Soviet technology I'm gonna focus on today is the fact you could actually hear about it earlier if you're into computers and old enough. The first mass-produced Soviet consumer's computer was covered in the Byte magazine by Leo Bors, an eye surgeon and a programmer who visited Soviet Union several times in the 80s. He had an opportunity to see the computer's prototype in August 1983 and wrote an article for the one of the most famous English IT magazines in November 1984. Hello YouTube, my name is Victor and you are watching the Russian Video Game Comrade Show. The theme of today's episode is Soviet Apple II clone Agat. Mr. Bors wrote in his article that Agat is a bad copy of the Apple. I will refer to his article several times during today's episode, but this statement is not completely true. Yes, there were some common features between Apple II and Agat. For example, both computers used the same CPU, MOS Technology 6502. But there are also several issues even with this statement. First, Agat used not the original MOS Technology CPU, but its clones, as USSR was under a lot of sanctions and couldn't input the original ones. And second, Mr. Bors tested a prototype that wasn't made even with the cloned 6502, but with a 588 series partitioned processor, which emulated the 6502 CPU instruction set and apparently was slower. And apart from that, Agat differed in a number of very significant elements and it couldn't run any original Apple II soft out of the box. The way to run native Apple II software on Agat was revealed later, and the latest model, Agat 9, even had a dedicated Apple II mode, but not the first ones. Also, there was another ridiculous rule in the USSR at that time. Manufacturers could use foreign electronic components only auxiliary. And KGB even didn't give a shit if you had a government order you couldn't fulfill with domestic elements. You could go to jail both for not achieving the order or for achieving it with not Soviet-approved parts. So Soviet engineers had to find a workaround, as none of Soviet manufacturers could start the production of a Russian analog of 6502 by the time Agat had to be mass-produced. They started to secretly import 6502 clones from India, Bulgaria and Taiwan and rip off the markings of the CPUs so no one could find out it wasn't a Soviet CPU. Here in the Agat 7 we will use today you can see such CPU. I don't know all the details, but rumor has it that someone from the top floor eventually discovered it. But instead of arranging reprisals, he made these imports legit. System ROM had 2 kilobytes of memory. It contained software for configuring base memory, a procedure to find the device for booting the operating system, and a small debugger for binaries. As for the RAM, there were several different amounts of RAM and Agats, and RAM usage is another big difference between Agat and Apple II. Base Agat 7s, the first mass-produced version of this computer, had 32 kilobytes of RAM on the mainboard and another 64 kilobytes added with modules. The amount of memory exceeded the address space of the processor, so memory was divided into sections that could be accessed by the processor only one by one. This is the first reason Apple's software wasn't compatible with Agat. And the second one was the video controller. It was also pre-installed on the mainboard and could use any memory area of the mainboard's 32K RAM as a buffer. Apple II Plus used one 40x24 pixels text mode and two graphical ones. 40x48 and 2080x192 pixels. Also, all the Apple modes used two fixed memory areas as a buffer. On the other hand, Agat had two text modes, 32x32 32 characters in color and 64x32 in black and white, and three graphical modes, 64x64 and 128x128 pixels in color and 256x256 pixels in black and white. So even if you wanted to port Apple II software to Agat, you had to do a lot of work. And eventually there were a lot of ports. But one more time, software wasn't compatible out of the box, so technically Agat wasn't Apple II's clone. The thing that was really cloned from Apple is Agat's floppy disk drive with disk 2 standard. Till the latest Agat 9 model, all the Agats used 140 kilobytes 5-inch floppy disks. There was also an option to use tape, but who needs tape when you have an FDD, right? 
Well, wrong if you use Soviet Disk 2 clones. Agat used Bulgarian floppy disk drives made for a real Apple II clone, Pravitz 82. It was an ordinary Apple's 140K FDD clone with a modded control board. And it was made so poorly both from circuity and mechanics side that these drives recently damaged information on the disk and often couldn't even read floppy disks written on themselves several minutes ago. The funniest thing is nobody cared. Even the Bulgarian guys who made these FDDs discarded using them fast, but not the Soviet manufacturers of Agat. I also have to mention that not only FDDs in Agats were bad, a lot of components were. If you'll take a look at the computer I'm using today, you'll see that it's in a really good shape. All the soldering here is good and clean and the circuit boards look quite neat for a 35 years old computer. But it's because this one was carefully restored by nowadays Russian retro PC collectors. And here's some photos of the original factory soldering in the 80s. Freaking nightmare! And also, keep in mind that the fact Agat was the first mass-produced Soviet computer didn't mean that any Soviet citizen could buy it. For around 10 years of the mass production from 1984 till 1993, there were only around 20,000 of this produced, and the retail price for Agat was 3,900 rubles. The average salary in the Soviet Union at that time was from 1 to 2,000 rubles a year. Most of the agates were used either by students in schools and universities or by employees of the rich companies. And even for this ridiculously expensive price, you could get a non-working new computer. Welcome to the Soviet Union, guys! I even found a letter from one of the teachers of the computer class in Kazakhstan's city, Karaganda, seeking help. As you may know, Kazakhstan was a part of the Soviet Union back then. This letter was printed in Soviet magazine Informatics and Education in 1988. Government promised to provide us with at least 9 computer classes in Karaganda in 1987. It's already 1988 and we still not only have 3 computer classes instead of 9, but even in these classes not all the computers work. The latest supply contained 13 Agat PCs and 5 of them were already dead on arrival. We immediately contacted the manufacturer, but they said that they don't handle warranty repair and forwarded us to another company. That company forwarded us to another company. And so on. Can you imagine such an attitude in any other country? I bet such PC manufacturers would go bankrupt in no time elsewhere. But not in the Soviet Union, cause we had no alternatives. And the most interesting thing here is how people's minds adapted to this in the Union. If we'll take a look at one of the next issues of this magazine, we'll find another interesting article named How to fix Agat by yourself, by another teacher from Russian city Chelyabinsk. I'll quote it for you. Sincere sympathy evokes a heartbreaking story about the misadventures of one teacher and Agat computers published in one of the previous issues of this magazine. However, the folk Russian saying immediately comes to mind. It's not the overseas machine that works well but the one in good hands. You really need to know and love your machine, or it won't be good neither in the capital nor in the suburbs. And it doesn't matter if it's an IBM PC or a calculator. And after this pompous introduction, the author of the article tells that they also had agates, some of them were also dead on arrival and others started to eventually fail. But instead of making outraged calls to the manufacturer or writing letters in the magazine, they just disassembled one of the machines themselves, figured out the way it worked, drew schematic diagrams for the computers and started to fix and improve them themselves. And this is the way it has to be done. He says it's almost prescriptive. And the most hilarious thing here, he doesn't even offer his help or at least the diagrams. He just says, we did, so do it yourself. You have computers, it's already a great luck. The best country and the best people in the world. It was a brief story of what is Agat and how good it was, and now let's dive into it a little deeper. First, let's get back to the article in the Byte magazine and Mr. Bors himself. As I've already said, he used one of the first Agat prototypes that didn't even have a real 6502 CPU, so all the benchmarks were worse than on the Apple II. Agat had several revisions. After the red one used by Mr. Bors, there was Agat 4. 
It was a 100 units pilot batch used for exhibitions and some early school pilot projects, mainly in Novosibirsk. They say it was very close to the Agat 7 model released in 1985 and produced the most. We have the same Agat 7 computer here. Using the Agat computer, Mr. Bors found a lot of similarities and sometimes even really bootlegged and adapted for Soviet computers Apple's software. Apple DOS 3.3 using original boot partition, Apple Toolkit and even ROM contained a variant of Apple Soft. From this side we can name Agat an Apple II clone. But all the software isn't compatible. You can't use Agat software on Apple II as well. I laughed out loud when I read an assumption that Russians could make this to avoid being sued by Apple. USSR was a closed country, almost like North Korea now. Maybe a little less totalitarian, but very same in most aspects. Can you imagine Apple finding out that North Koreans made an iPhone clone for use in their country and trying to sue them? No, they can try, of course, but will Kim Jong-un care? I don't think so. Even now in Russia you can find posters where, for example, Tom Cruise advertised a transport company. Do you think he or his agents know it? I highly doubt it. And it's 2021, and Russia now is more or less open country with worldwide contracts, connections, etc. And still there are no legal issues. Nobody wants to mess with the crazy Russians even in the 21st century. And you're telling me about legal actions in 1984? LOL. To be honest, his sum up was a little unexpected for me too. Ok, I can understand his astonishment on the price of the agate he was told. I'm not sure why he was told that agate costs $1700, but I can assume that it was somehow made up for the foreign guest. Maybe even because there was no retail price yet and it still was only a prototype. As I've already said, the price of agate 7 was 3900 rubles. Official exchange rate in 1984 was 80 rubles for 100 US dollars. So the price was around 3000 to 100 dollars for a computer. The phrase clearly they had not researched the competition is also quite fun. There was no competition in the Soviet Union at all. Everything was owned by the government and still all the high-tech goods were in shortage. But this doesn't mean people in the Soviet Union were dumb Mr. Bors. Yes, maybe sometimes a little rude to each other like those two teachers in the magazine story before. But I personally think that they behaved like that just because their lives were much harder in the Union back then than ours in Russia now. But they weren't dumb. And to be honest, it's a little insulting to read such lines. Even if a microcomputer were available to Russians for use in the home, it would have to be very cheap to compete with more mundane but more desirable consumer goods such as refrigerators and washing machines. Besides, what would Soviet citizens do with a home computer? They certainly don't need to worry about investments or figure out income tax. People all across the world knew what to do with their home computers except taxes and investments. Mr. Bors himself used the computer with Soviet ophthalmologist software. A lot of engineers in the Union in the 80s already used computers, people programmed software on them, and so on. And the most simple answer – video games. Why Soviet people couldn't at least use it for playing games? Despite the low availability of any computers in Soviet Russia, we had a lot of IT periodic magazines, and high-tech stuff was a great desire of the most Soviet people like all the others around the world. Yes, it was very hard even to buy simple consumer electronics in Soviet Union like refrigerators. Here is a photo from 1990s Leningrad. The sign on the shop reads, all the pre-orders of refrigerators for the upcoming 5 years are closed. Yes, it was a bummer, but still, what would Soviet citizen do with a home computer sounds at least strange. Here's for example an article in another Soviet magazine, Microprocessor Tools and Systems from 1984. Who needs a PC and for what? And there are a lot of answers there. High price, or I'd better say unaffordable price, is another question. But people in the Soviet Union had a great interest in computers like all the others around the globe. The assumption that Agat was developed with education in mind is a correct one. And not only for centers of higher learning, but for the ordinary middle and high schools too. And it wasn't the only computer used in schools. Sometime later in the 80s, there were not only several Russian different computers in Soviet schools, but even imported ones. For example, Japanese MSX2 machines. 
The main purpose of EGOT was to teach students to write code and get acquainted with the computer. By 1987, when the range of Soviet personal computers for education spread to six different variants, EGOT became one of the most favored computers by both the teachers and the students. It was faster than anything except Yamaha MSX2, easy to operate and maintain, and the most important, all the EGOTs could be standalone machines, independent of each other. You see, all the educational computers, including Yamaha MSX, were supplied as a batch. One computer class consisted of one main teacher's machine and a dozen of student ones, connected to a local network. And only the main teacher's PC had floppy disk drives, color screen and a printer controller. If the main computer failed, all the other ones became almost useless. And you couldn't even fix it with spare parts from other PCs, as they differed technically. If one of Agates failed, even the teacher's one, you could just use parts from any other one and get it back online fast. Plus, every Agate came with 10 floppy disks, two with software and eight blank ones. Most of the other computers didn't even have an FDD and floppy disks themselves were also expensive and rare in the Soviet Union. As for the soft side, EGOT also had a vast range of products, mostly non-profit ones. This included EGOT Basic that also allowed usage of assembler, EGOT DOS, educational system schoolgirl, EGOT database programs, original text processor, several other utilities and, of course, games. Some of them were ported from Apple II, some were original ones. For example, we had unique chess and checkers games written especially for Agates, or solid clones of Load Runner or even Mario Brothers. This is an Agate 7 version, and this is the later Agate 9 version. Sometime later, an interesting Agate add-on was released. It was called Controller 121, and basically it allowed it to run Apple II software on Agate natively. And this time you can definitely say that Agate was a clone of Apple II. Later model Agat 9 had the option to run Apple II software out of the box without an add-on. You just had to switch it to the Apple II mode. From now on, you could run Apple software, but couldn't run Agat software. Basically, Agat 9 was two different computers in one. It was also redesigned technically. For example, you can see that the CPU and the RAM were placed on the motherboard itself and hadn't been installed as a separate circuit boards. The only additional circuit board here is an additional controller. It could be used to attach another FDD, but now it's used to attach an FDD emulator. And also, Agat 9 had a better 840K floppy disk drive, almost compatible with other computers. For example here, guys installed a reliable TIG FDD instead of the original shitty Bulgarian one. But overall, Agat 9 is the same Agat 7, with more RAM and more built-in options. Agat's engineers planned to release a lot of other models for the computer back then. This included hard disk drive controller, separate sound card and even a frame grabber. But unfortunately, their plans weren't desired to come true. In 1991, Iron Curtain fell and a lot of Western computers flooded the Russian market. The most popular among them was Sir Clive Sinclair's ZX Spectrum. It was not only really cheap, but also quite easy to clone, so it displaced almost every Russian PCs from the Russian market. And then, in the mid-late 90s, people in Russia started to earn enough money to buy a real IBM PC compatible machines. And this was it. Soviet inventions weren't needed no more. And it's a shame, as we had at least several really interesting Soviet inventions. Finding negative computers now is really a tough task. Around 20,000 units were produced, and almost none of them were bought for home usage. In the 90s, when schools and facilities decommissioned them, most of the units were utilized or simply thrown into the trash. And only some units were preserved by enthusiasts. In addition to that, all the Soviet retro computers used either gold-plated elements or elements containing other precious metals. So, those who had such decommissioned computers and had a passion for the techniques or history just destroyed them to get some money out of scrap. For example, Agat's elements contained 1 gram of gold and 7 grams of silver. Cost of this is roughly 50 US dollars max, but people are always people, especially poor people. And in the early 90s, a lot of people in Russia literally starved. So who I am to judge them? And almost all of the preserved agates won't function today unless you're a really good technician who can fix stuff. Fully recap, resolder, tune the FDD and etc. It's a ton of work with a lot of knowledge needed. 
There is a big community in Russian internet dedicated to Agat computers, where enthusiasts not only preserve and share software for this computer and write Agat emulators for modern PCs, but even share their schematic diagrams, workarounds and tips on fixing every part of the luckily found in the wild Agats. But even with all of this, I'm not sure I could do any of this work myself, so I'm really grateful to the Russian Industrial University of Information Technology, Telecommunications, Information Security and Radio Engineering generally, and Viktor Boyev personally, for their help with filming this episode. And of course, for restoring the agat I showed you today. Yes, the story itself is already interesting enough, but when you can illustrate it with a working machine, it's just priceless. I hope you liked today's episode and willing to see more. Please press thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Have a nice day, good luck!